Hi and welcome to week 5's lecture. In this lecture we're going to cover fisheries conservation and rangeland management. So, a fishery is a place where fish are reared or allowed to grow for commercial purposes. Um, one of the problems is overfishing and overfishing is just a state where you have an aquatic organism and uh, you've taken out so many of them that you've affected their ability to regenerate their populations or to be able to sustain themselves. Um, we're going to look at uh, two places. The first is an exclusive economic zone, which is a country or a state's territorial waters where they have the rule of the sea over um, being able to fish or uh, acquire energy resources and it's generally from the coast to 200 nautical miles out and so those are prescribed areas where we can uh, regulate how many fish are caught. The second is beyond those in the open ocean and because those are no, no territories, waters uh, anybody can fish as much as they want to and there have been severe depletions and even extinctions of fish in these areas because there is no limit on the catch. So I'm going to do, use an example of the striped bass to walk you through what happens with overfishing and the methods ca that can be used that will help conserve and bring the population back to a healthy one. So. Um, <clears throat> Along the east coast of the United States, along the Atlantic states, uh, there's a fish called the striped bass. And in 1973, um, it was commercially fished, and they were catching about 5 million pounds of fish a year. And within 10 years, that yield had dropped to about uh, 2 million pounds of fish a year. And so what happened was that a, a, a group of states that had the fish offshore, because it's a migratory fish, you can't just have one state that is trying to regulate it. These states got together and they did a study to evaluate the state of the striped bass. And what they had found was that the excessive fishing pressure that had been put on it precipitated a very dangerous decline. So they put a moratorium on both commercial and sports fishing in that area so that they could study what they needed to do to be able to bring the population of striped bass back to a healthy population that was able to sustain itself. So what they did was they evaluated what had happened and they found that some of the um, factors that had allowed overfishing were the fact that uh, there were new techniques to uh, acquire the fish and then new technologies to be able to preserve the fish and sell the fish quickly so they were making more money so they could more quickly turn around and go out and catch more fish. Well, after they did the study, what they decided to do were um, put regulations on it, what could be done in the meantime while the, the population of the striped bass was actually... Um, rebounding. So they had uh, restrictions on uh, limits of how uh, the length of the fishing season, they had limits on how many pounds of fish could be caught, they had limits on overall number of people who had fishing licenses at the time, and during this they were uh, watching the population rebound so they decided to adopt regulations that they could put into place so that the fish we could still harvest them commercially and they could be a, a source of income and a source of food, but that it would be able to have the, the population not only not decline, but even thrive. So they adopted regulations uh, in 1995 and in 2003 when they allowed fishing again, they gave over 3 million licenses which brought in a total $6.5 billion for the industry. Um, and what they found when they looked at it last year was that there was absolutely no overfishing or seemed to be no threat of overfishing of the striped bass. Now this is just one aquatic animal that we're looking at. There are different types, there are different limits, and because uh, conservation efforts are being made right now, they're hoping that many of the other species don't reach uh, the serious situation that the the striped bass was in. Another problem with commercial fishing is that there is bycatch and these are just uh, other 
uh, marine organisms that are caught at the same time that weren't the target species. And what they do with the bycatch is they discard them. And <clears throat> these are thrown back in. The, the bycatch can either be, besides the non-target species, it can be ju juvenile fish, it can be endangered species, it can even be marine birds and mammals. And one of the problems with this is that after these have been caught, they have had a shock to their system that when they're put back and discarded, uh, a lot of them are either sick or these populations die. So one of the things that the marine fishery conservation is doing is they're looking into new techniques of being able to, to catch fish and to target a species and find a way to minimize the bycatch so that there aren't these uh, discards that are actually affecting other populations of animals. Um, the other thing that the fisheries conservation are doing is they're trying to determine for each species what's a maximum sustainable yield that we can catch and that is just the greatest amount of fish that you can catch every season that doesn't affect the reproductive capacity of that fish and if you calculate that you can calculate the optimum yield and the optimum yield is what can be caught for the most economic benefit um, but also will allow the ecosystem in the fishery to thrive in all other ways. So this is just one example with the striped bass of what um, what can happen in fisheries and some of the things that they're doing to mitigate the directs of o the effects of overfishing. Okay, now we're going to switch gears. Our next topic is rangeland management. And rangelands are areas in the world that are a source for forage, which is just food, um, for gra like grasses and shrubs for the free ranging animals and also for um, domestic animals. In the West, there are some rangelands that are owned by the Bureau of Land Management and the government, and they monitor these. And some cattle ranchers, um, because of the area, they will actually give them permits to send their cattle onto the government-owned rangelands so that they can forage there. So it's not just domestic animals. It can also it's not just free-ranging animals. It's also domestic animals. Um, the rangelands can also be sources of uh, wood products, water, minerals, and energy. They can be recreational areas. And most of these areas are not suitable for cultivation because they are either rough topography or there's low precipitation. There may be poor drainage or colder temperatures. So these rangelands aren't, aren't usable for uh, cultivation because of these conditions. Now, for each rangeland, you want to measure carrying capacity, and carrying capacity has been something that we've seen in every chapter in our book. What is the carrying capacity of the earth for people? What is the carrying capacity of the ocean for fish? What is the carrying capacity for rangelands? Well, the carrying capacity for a rangeland of a habitat is the size of a population of a species that can be sustained in that habitat and have it thrive. Um, the grazing carrying capacity is the maximum number of animals that can graze in an area without causing a downward trend in forage production, forage quality, or soil quality. And this goes back to what is the range condition. Um, the carrying capacity is going to affect the range condition. And the range condition is just the current state of the vegetation in a range in relation to its natural plant community. Um, it's an estimate of, of, of what the natural uh, range condition would be like, what the natural plants in the area would be like, and what's going to keep it healthy for not just current use, but for future use. So we're gonna look at a few problems that can affect range condition. And the first one is overgrazing. So if you have an area where you have uh, continued overgrazing, it's going to exceed the carrying capacity of the, of the um, community and of the plants and it's going to result in the deterioration of the range. Uh, for example, if you have too many livestock that are feeding on a particular area 
at the same time it's going to take all of the forage or all of the plants off of it and you're not going to have the roots that are going to hold down the soil so you're going to have excessive erosion from um, wind and water so you're going to lose part of the topsoil which is then going to affect if you want to if these plants want to grow again you're going to have worse soil or no soil for them to be able to grow again so you're you're perpetuating a loss of uh, soil conditions and overgrazing and it will uh, could ultimately affect any kinds of fertility in that area a second problem that affects range condition is actually undergrazing. And the undergrazing, um, if an area is not grazed enough, it will allow a lot of dry leaf litter and sticks and everything to grow on the ground. And so you won't get the native grasses growing. You'll get shrubby plants. And if you don't have the natural grasses growing there, the, the shrubby plants root systems are not extensive and they're not deep. So actually you will again have the soil be able to deteriorate because you're not holding it in place and you're also not allowing the the natural vegetation of the area to grow. So undergrazing is also something can, that can affect range conditions. Um, the third big one is what's called sod busting and sod busting is where you plow um, native rangeland and native rangeland is we talked about the fact it's not good for cultivation so <clears throat> when 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 people not just in the united states in, in other countries they they don't have fertile ground um, there's not an arable land uh, a lot of arable land that they can use uh, especially in less developed countries they will move on to rangeland 